a rather imposing title for the sermon, don't you think so today? How do I get kicked out of the family? I've known some people that seem to have a plan for that. You know what I mean? They kind of worked on that to get themselves kicked out. I want to read a verse from that second reading that Logan read. The father said, let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for family. It reveals our need for you. Thank you for God's family. It's our only hope. Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak to us this day that we would understand your tremendous grace and love for us. And we might know how much you truly love us. Amen. Perhaps you've been connected to a family or even had a family where people disowned each other. Or, as I said to Joseph this morning, you are dead to me. A terrible idea. One maybe that we're more afraid of than we ever can admit. That somehow we wouldn't measure up to being in the family. In my family growing up, and I've got my sister Jan right here in the second row. Okay, everybody say hi, Jan. Hi, hi Jan. All right. Doesn't bother her. She's an extrovert like I am. Won't bother her. Okay. All right. But she will testify to this. My mother was a given. She'd tell you anything, anytime, okay? Sometimes to your embarrassment, but there was never any doubt where she stood. On the other hand, my dad, not so much. My dad reminded me of an old Norwegian who loved his wife so much, once he almost told her, that would be my dad, okay? And so when I grew up, I never doubted that my mom loved me, demonstratively, but I always wondered about my dad. Did I really have what it takes to make him proud of me? Did he love me? Did he care? I wasn't sure until many years later when I realized, and he and I could have the conversations, that a lot of the separation between him and me was because of my attitude. Constantly thinking somehow that he didn't love me. When, how did he show love? Actions. Every day, he'd open the door at the end of chores and he'd say, Hey, all you lucky people, how are you? It was the best time of the day for him to be with his family around the supper table. That was what made him know that he was loved and that made us know that we were loved. But however the case may be, a lot of us actually have this fear of, am I really accepted in the family? I remember a a time when we were on the East Coast. And this was early on when Margaret and I had gotten married. And I had suffered some with my first wife's family. Um, they, they had a lot of dysfunction. Let's just put it that way. It's a nice way to say that. And I really, really wanted to be close to Margaret's family. And I remember we were out on a walk. And I said to her, I, I don't know if your family likes me. You ever had that feeling? I don't know if your family likes me. Am I really accepted into that family? Pastor Josh mentioned this last week. You know, is that person really accepted? I think we, we all have had those kind of struggles. 
Am I really accepted in the family? I'm going to start with this first point today to make one thing crystal clear. God has made you part of his family. Do you notice that in Kelly's prayer today, during the songs, she emphasized that we don't do anything to be made part of the family. God looked down on a bunch of disobedient, rebellious prodigals, and he said, I know what I'm going to do. And we expect the next line to be, I'm going to grind you under my heel. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, he said. I'm going to send my only son, whom I love more than life itself, and I'm going to send him into the world to be sacrificed, to die on a cross, so that you can be saved, so that you can be part of the family. God made you part of his family for all who would repent of their sins, who would believe in Jesus Christ, be baptized into his name. He gives the power to become sons of God. Now understand why it doesn't say sons and daughters is because daughters in those days didn't have as much inheritance rights. So the Bible wants to make clear everybody gets full inheritance. Everybody gets to be part of the family. Nobody's second class. Everybody is an heir of this grace. God made you part of his family. But now we have a problem. Because you see, we all have had different types of parents. We all have our struggles about this. And so we ask ourselves this question, what kind of father is God anyway? What kind of father is God? That's a big question. Because I need to know the answer to that if I'm going to know how secure I am in this family. The first question we ask ourselves is, is he a cruel taskmaster? The elder son in the story, when you hear that whole story of the, of the lost son, that older son believed his father to be a cruel taskmaster. And the younger son wasn't far behind. He's fallen into disrepute. Sure enough, he's the bad boy, the black sheep. He's wasted all his inheritance, all his father's money, He ends up in a stinking pig pen, and he comes to his senses and says, I have no chance to be a son again, because I deserve wrath. I'm going to beg, and I'm going to beg for some pity. I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but maybe you could make me as one of your lowest hired servants. I could sleep in the bunkhouse. Is that the kind of father we have? Someone who looks and sees all your sins and holds you accountable for every one of them. I remember growing up, we read from uh, Little Lessons for God, the devotional. And there was one of them that kind of scared me. And it was a story about a boy who had a big TV screen on his head. And it showed all his thoughts. And I thought to myself, if anybody could see my thoughts, the anger, the selfishness, the pride, the jealousy, the meanness, you think my outside grumpiness is bad. You should read what's in there. And God, he can see it all. He looks right inside your head. He looks inside your heart, and he knows exactly who you are. And if he is a cruel taskmaster, 
if you're going to live under divine judgment, woe is you. Woe is me. But here's the great news. What kind of father do we have? Is he a cruel taskmaster? And the answer is an emphatic no. He is an outrageous giver. An outrageous giver. Look at this story that Jesus tells. This father is crazy loving. He is a crazy lover of his kids. He gives them the inheritance because he knows he needs to suffer through losing it all. He is willing to give away part of his possessions so that his son could be taught a lesson so that they could develop a love relationship. When the son goes absolutely bad and loses everything, stinks up his life, literally, when he sees him coming, he does what no Jewish middle-aged man would ever do. Remember, they wore those robes, you know? He girds up his loins and he runs down the road. And his son starts the speech, right? I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father grabs him and won't let him go on. And the tears spill down, and he kisses his neck, his dirty, stinking neck. And he, and he hugs his son, this ragged, sinful son. He hag, hugs him to himself and says, no more of this talk. Get the new robe. Get the ring. Get the sandals. Kill the fatted calf. Party, party! <laughs> he is outrageously giving to his son. There's no bunkhouse for you. There's no punishment for you. There is nothing but grace for you. This is the God who breaks all of our conventional thinking because we think we're going to pay for it. I remember when our our youngest son, Ben, went through this phase. I don't know if any of your kids ever went through this phase, but this kid goes through this phase where he tried to pay us for, for everything. It didn't last long. <laughs> but, you know, that kind of thinking that we're going to pay God off, that we're going to somehow earn our righteousness, earn our salvation, be good enough. Andy Stanley asked the question in a little book entitled, How Good is Good Enough? Folks, there ain't good enough for God. He's the holy, perfect God. Isaiah, which Joseph brought up here just last week, the call of Isaiah in the temple And the angels fly around the throne and the temple foundations shake and they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And what is Isaiah's reaction? He quakes, he trembles and he cries out, I am an unclean man living among an unclean people and I have unclean lips. I can't even speak to God, I'm so unclean. And the angel takes a coal from the altar and holds it to his lips and say, your sins have been atoned for. It is God who gives, not us. There's something very wrong in families when this gets turned upside down. And I've met a number of these families where the parents expect a whole bunch from their kids. No, I don't mean, you know, the normal thing, like when you grow up, you do the chores. You remember that. And, and that, you know, you show some respect. You remember that. Okay? All right. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when the children end up supporting the parents financially when they're kids. This happened in a family that I knew, that the parents would, quote, borrow money from the kids, that they had earned from hard work. There was something really backwards about that. 
We all understand that. Parents are to give to the children, and we are God's children, and he gives to us. We don't pay him back. We don't earn a place in the family. When you're born into a family, you don't earn a place. You just show up. When you get adopted into a family, you don't earn your way in. They just pick you up. God's the giver, and we're the recipients. And boy, that's humbling, isn't it? We want to be the elder son. The elder son who stands in judgment of his brother. In fact, he won't even call him brother. He says, this son of yours. Boy, he was a piece of work. He's the Pharisee. Dad, you never, you never even slaughtered a baby goat for me and my friends. I've always slaved for you, Dad. Where's mine? And the father looks at him and says, you've always been with me. I give to you continually. You can have anything you want, but come on. Come on, forgive your brother. Quit judging him. Come and join the party. Mm -mm. No. I want to I be judgmental and mean. Oh, I wonder which one was more like the father. The kid who rebelled and then asked forgiveness and came back? Or the son who outwardly obeyed and was Mr. Self-Righteous? who judges his brother and everyone around him. God is this giver, and he wants us to be givers. In fact, that's our last point today. Let us celebrate his grace. And the way we celebrate his grace is we help other people to meet Jesus, follow Jesus, and share Jesus. We love people outrageously. We give to them like God gives to us. And we want them to be part of the family. Look at what the Father does. He gives. He celebrates. He says, you know, my son was lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. We gotta celebrate. We have to celebrate. We have to celebrate. Our life should be a celebration of God's grace, of God's good gifts for us. Yesterday, we experienced a celebration of Vern Mock's life. We had about 150 people there, by the way. It was a pretty good party, even though we couldn't have a reception, you know. But I mean, it, was, it was awesome. But here's the deal. Don't wait till you're dead to celebrate. Let's celebrate each other every day. And that family did. They let each other know that they loved one another every day. Let's let each other know that we love one another. Let's celebrate. Every day is a celebration. Because every day God gives his grace and his love for us. And I want you to know that God wants every one of you to be part of his family. Every one of you. He wants Nori, Daryl, and Naomi, and Helen, and Dwayne, and Mike, and Deb, and Glenn, and Sally. She knew I was going to do that to her and Patty, and Dawn, and, and every one of us. He wants us to be part of his family, and he celebrates that every day. Do you notice what Polly said so well? There's a party in heaven every time one of us repents. Just think how much fun it is that as we confess our sins and we turn our faces toward God and the angels are all celebrating. It must be a continual party because there's a lot of repentance going on down here. It is a wonderful thing. We are celebrating his grace because you and I were made part of his family. And here's the answer to the question. How do I get kicked out of God's family? You 
can't. Oh, you can try. You can run away like the prodigal. You can try to push the father off, but the father's still waiting right there. Hey, kid, come on, come on. So when I came to this congregation three years ago, and I met Vern Mock, okay, and I I came to Bruce and I said, you know, I know Vern's got some dementia going on here. Is that why he's so outrageous? And Bruce just started laughing. And he says, oh, no, he was way more outrageous before the dementia. And so I purposely use this word today, outrageous, thinking of Vern, this outrageous, giving person, and that's nothing compared to God. How outrageously he loves you and me. And no matter how far away we get, he's always there with his open arms. If that grace is too much for you, join the club. It's hard to take, isn't it? To take that much love to take that much grace. I just want to end with this, that there was a, a man who's come to our church a few times, and I had the privilege of getting to sit down and really talk to him about spiritual things. And he said he was raised in a very legalistic cult. And I sat and had the pleasure of telling him that his sins are completely forgiven in Jesus Christ. He said, what? I said, you don't have to do anything. He loves you unconditionally. He said, really? We talked for 10 minutes about nothing but this concept of grace because he had never, ever, ever in his family, in the church, in his relationships, ever heard this idea that his sins were forgiven completely and that he could celebrate that. And so today, let us celebrate this fact that God, instead of kicking us out of his family like he should have, instead sent his own son for us and brought us in and he will not let you How outrageous, how wonderful. Jesus, thank you for your outrageous grace. Thank you for your love to us. We ask, Lord, that you would grant us your attitude of love and grace for others, that all the world might know how much you have loved us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.